This is an Achilles tendon rupture talk uh, given at the Oswestry Foot and Ankle course at the end of 2020. Uh, this has been uh, clipped slightly for uh, the general audiences of YouTube. I hope you enjoy. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Lyndon Mason. I'm one of the foot and ankle uh, surgeons in the Liverpool University Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. <clears throat> I'm the consultant lead for the Heel Pain Stroke Achilles Clinic uh, that is provisionally run by my colleague, Mr. Allison. Um, we'd like to discuss at this point about the Achilles tendon ruptures. So I'm going to go through the anatomy, pathology, the diagnosis, and then subsequent treatment. So first of all, the anatomy. So the Achilles ten tendon is a confluence of both the soleus muscle, which attaches to the back of the tibia and fibula, and the gastrocnemius muscles, which uh, have two heads that both insert above the knee. And these come together, and you can see the apneosis uh, uh, forming onto one another, as you can see here, which then uh, goes down into your triceps suri. You can actually divide these all the way down to its insertion, and a number of authors have looked at these insertion types, um, most of which have found this. This is from one of my colleagues, Mr. Malloy, up in Liverpool, where they found that the most posterior aspect was the medial head, the gastrocnemius, which has gone from medial and has rotated round to the back. And here the soleus, which is from the inferior aspect, and then the lateral head, the gastrocnemius, is here. Uh, this study in the clinical anatomy uh, in 2009 uh, showed the uh, different areas of blood supply where you have the posterior tibial artery supplying the proximal and distal seg segment. And this area, which is often referred to as the watershed area, the area where you get non surgical Achilles tendinopathies and most commonly get ruptures, is actually formed from your perineal artery, which is the lateral side. And most people, when they're approaching the tendon Achilles, won't go directly over the top, but actually it'll go more medial. And most commonly that's due to the sural nerve on the lateral side, which is at risk of getting damaged. But also, if you are doing, say, an ankle approach for a posterior malleolar fracture, and you're going to skirt down the uh, lateral side of the Achilles tendon, you are risking of uh, damaging these blood vessels. So for pathology, I'll go through the demographics and pathomechanics. So demographics, Achilles tendons are very common. We, in our unit, which is quite a large unit, we get approximately five a month. 75% uh, of all Achilles tendon ruptures are related to sports. Uh, this is uh, specific to Achilles as most other uh, tendons ruptures are um, from other causes. Histology, I uh, find that most of them have an underlying degeneration. Uh, high in sedentary lifestyle competing in sports, so people who uh, work in a, a sit-down job all week, for example, and on the weekend go and play sport, a so-called weekend warrior, uh, much more common in males and much more common in the young. Uh, this is the uh, feed-in where you have intrinsic factors and extrinsic factors and the physical activity, i.e. the sports are very specific to Achilles tendons. You know, overuse symptoms, tendinopathy, and then degenerative changes. These either heal, or if they continually uh, um, uh, go through abnormal forces, you get a partial rupture, which can then uh, complete to a complete tendon rupture. So this is a stress strain graph. You can see the unkinked of the tendons. So you got the toe in region, and then you got the elastic region. And this physiological area is where you expect most tendons to be. However, as you get overuse injury, you get this three to five uh, percent, and then five to eight percent. And if you're in this area, you can regenerate from here. But if you persist within this area, you then can progress with a tendon rupture. It usually happens by um, forces uh, undergoing through eccentric, eccentric stretching. So we can see uh, he's forcing and. In, you can see a rupture then as the uh, muscle unit is lengthening. So it's forces going through a lengthening unit. Uh, 
um, diagnosis. I'll go through the presentation, examination, investigation. So on diagnosis, they usually describe uh, feeling like they've been hit on the back of the heel with a bat or they feel a very large snapping sensation or they've been shot in the back of the heel. They can hear a loud bang. It usually works uh, in, as I said earlier, sedentary jobs, sitting jobs, and then play sport uh, once or twice a week. Pre-existing conditions, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, gout, ankylosis, spondylitis, chronic ure uremia, and hyperparathyroidism. Uh, but this is usually less than 2%. Uh, medication, fluidoquinolone, phenytoin. Uh, these are specific uh, and usually present with bilateral pain rather than one side. And the pharmacist will usually explain that this is a cause, especially with fluoroquinolones, um, before they give them the medication. Uh, genetically, a uh, strong association of blood group zero, um, but we do not know why. So this is your weekend warrior, really. Uh, someone who uh, only uh, commits to sport once or twice a week. You get a, a palpable gap. It's not always uh, sometimes the swelling, such as one like this, where the swelling would uh, not um, show you the gap. And so if the swell on the back, you've got a low, um, a, a low bar of uh, suspicion, um, as this is also a potential Achilles rupture. Uh, Simmons test is pathognomonic or Thompson test if you are um, the other side of the Atlantic. You squeeze the calf and you have a movement of the foot. Now a Thompson test or Simmons test uh, theoretically should be in the fully um, prone position. Um, the reason for this is if the leg is straight because the gastrocnemius attaches above the knee it's at the longest and you have the most likely uh, a movement of the foot, uh, but you can do it in a seated position. This is a uh, chronic tear that's been taken to theatre. And you can see this sort of the tension on the good side on the right there. And then when you push on the other side, you can see no tension whatsoever. I wouldn't advocate this in a acute rupture, however, if the foot's in a uh, quietness position, a clot may already start being formed around this region, and separating that clot is not advisable. So uh, diagnosis, uh, you can do an x-ray, especially if you are worried about a uh, avulsion area, and I uh, do recommend in our practice that we uh, do have a lateral x-ray of all to ensure this, and you can see often, like this, a palpable gap, and then the loss of definition of this cake is fat pad but this does have a low specificity and sensitivity. The use of ultrasound and MRI, this is not ubiquitous to every unit. Some units uh, say that all have to have ultrasounds. However, this um, review, which was done a number of years ago, 56 studies included uh, sensitivity of detecting rupture range from 80 to 100 percent. Well, ultrasound was uh, seen as better than MRI for diagnosis and monitoring, but they did conclude uh, primarily on clinical examination is what you should rely on. Evaluation using imaging, uh, ruling out other injuries, providing additional clinical information. And I would agree with this. This is what we do in our unit. The concern sometimes is when you're using uh, just clinical diagnosis, you don't know what the gap is. And there's been some concern uh, in the literature of uh, if there's a gap, should you uh, proceed for a uh, repair rather than a um, uh, rather than conservative management. This was uh, published this year uh, from the Royal Berkshire Hospital, where they looked at and found a significant difference. If it was greater than uh, one centimeter, just about uh, reached uh, uh, statistical significance between the ATRS. If you have a look at the mean ATRS for these. So 0 to 10, a uh, mean of 80, and greater than 10 is a mean of 70. However, the greatest uh, statistical significance in this paper was actually if they're male or female, so 80 to 67. 
Uh, this paper was showed um, they done um, the regression analysis specifically for this and looking at the gap effect and even gaps very large on this paper didn't show any effect between it. Uh, so the large paper than the previous. So there is still debate in the literature whether or not uh, gaps uh, cause a, a problem. This is then looking at the ATRS in functional management. You then have not had a randomization between functional and um, a repay. Uh, so this is uh, still very much debated. Uh, something else to note, so this was a randomized control trial where they put tantalum beads at surgery. So all these patients had surgery, put tantalum beads in and then watch them over a year and then uh, radiographs over this period and see if there was lengthening. And you can see at um, six months, you did have an elongation of each of the tendons. Uh, so if you are repairing, uh, don't expect that it's going to stay in that position. You will get the elongation, as you can see, around about five mil per tendon. So if treatment, I'm going to go through the basic science initially, uh, some history behind it, functional rehab, surgery, and then the um, treatment for chronic ruptures. So basic science. So this is work that was back uh, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, based on usually flex tendons in the hands. After three days, type 1 collagen production increases 15 to 22 fold. After two weeks, the fibrous bridge consists of fibroblasts and collagen fibers, which fuses the ends of the tendon. And between three to four weeks, the collagen fibers begin to organize longitudinally. A process continues then for a number of months. If you immobilize it, um, so there's no passive motion, then they undergo uh, intrinsic healing from the tendon cells from the epitinon. Uh, but if immobilized, the tendon heals predominantly by granulation tissue from the endotenon. Collagen fibro crosslinks improves with applied stress. So the more stress you put through it, that's why we've pushed through to functional rehab now, the um, more uh, this crosslink, uh, collagen fibro crosslink occurs. So again, it's back from the 1970s, Gelman showed the protective passive mobilization significantly increased load to failure compared to immobilization. And Enron Maka in a rat model, early functional activity produced increased tendon strength without increasing re-rupture. Uh, so we knew this in uh, flex tendons in the hands, for example, 40, 50 years ago. However, it's only really been the last 10 years with Achilles tendons that this uh, has gone from treating everyone in a cast in a flex position to a much more active rehabilitation. So before we moved on to this functional rehab, this is a, a randomized control uh, meta-analysis. Um, as you can see, the papers, 1981, 93, 97, 2001. So these are historical papers. So you can see that they favored open surgery and the re-rupture rate was usually uh, discussed as a 10% in uh, if you treated someone in a plaster and 1% if you treated someone with surgery. And this was a common operation when I started orthopedics, even when I started uh, my registrar years. So uh, functional rehab then uh, became the norm. So this paper really was the instigator of this. This was uh, from Belfast, my actual colleague, my now colleague, Mr. Hayes, is on this paper. Uh, Richard Wallace was the senior author at the time. As you can see, uh, it, was a, um, it was a very, very large observational study of their own practice. So this wasn't a randomized control trial, so it was a level four. However, the, the numbers were extremely high. What was really interesting is that their series of 2.9%, was as good as any surgical that had gone before it. You can see previously the conservative ruptures were very high. And Swansea, uh, which uh, our unit uses the, called the SMART protocol, uh, they published this, the BJJ, a number of years ago. And this was uh, the Aquinas and full weight bear cast and wedge in best position that opposes the tendon ends and then uh, into a what we term a vacuum head boot, which is a, a externally external applied uh, Aquinas uh, boot that comes up from 30 degrees and gradually up to a normal position. 
they found that their re-rupture rate on 273 patients using this protocol was 1.1%. And uh, many other units around the country now are reporting very similar numbers with this uh, functional rehab. In the paper, they also noted that as they were becoming more and more confident with the conservative treatment, they stopped operating patients, as you can see. This was published last year, uh, the Leicester Achilles Management Protocol. It's quite similar to the uh, SMART protocol. However, you don't have the zero to two weeks a, uh, time in a plaster before mobilizing it. You have this zero to four strain to the back bed boot. Uh, we ourselves have stuck with the SMART protocol specifically and the reason for this, for us, it was easier to get patients from accident emergency into a clinic within that two week window. Uh, they reported 2% uh, re-ruptures, uh, meaning ATRS or 75, same as the SMART protocol, average of 23 months post injury. So what is functional management? So he, functional management has to be specific. If you're going to get the same results as these other studies, you have to do it in their way. Uh, achieve appropriate tendon length to allow muscular capacity and function, uh, reliance upon appropriate position in the orthosis, and then tendon end acquisition. But as you can see in these multiple different authors, um, apart from uh, the last two authors of the SMART and the LAMP study, they all use very different uh, boots and mostly with these wedges. This is what we were using previously. We had this boot and we had these wedges, uh, but we did have some concern within our unit that um, we weren't getting a, a great result as compared to the SMART uh, protocol that was being reported from Swansea. And when we uh, started x-raying uh, patients either in a uh, cast such as this or with the wedges in, you could see that we weren't getting this Aquinas position. It was uh, virtually identical to if you just put in someone in a boot uh, without the wedges because this um, plantaris was going through the midfoot rather than the hindfoot. This is the vacuped boot, which was, wasn't getting the same level as the plaster, but was certainly getting a, a very good uh, plantar flexion of, of the hindfoot. You can see the control group and the wedges uh, was no different. So you may as well put someone in a boot without wedges at all. The external, external equinus boots of the vacuped uh, had a much uh, greater angulation not to the level of the cast, but certainly to the levels that we expected with the treatment we were using. So the next question was plaster or brace. So this was the a UK STAR trial, and they found no, AT, uh, no difference in ATRS at nine months, no difference or a rate of re-rupture tendon. So the argument with this was you can brace someone safely. Um, you don't, uh, there's no concern of coming out of a plaster. However, you could flip that, well, why is the plaster no different to the brace? Because this is what we say in the functional rehab should have a difference. Unfortunately, this was the boot they were using. So we get back to the same uh, argument that we just discussed. If you're going to do functional rehab, you have to do it uh, in a way that are uh, being reported in the other studies. Uh, this really is not a true functional rehab. Post-operative complications, uh, 615 patients was included in the study. They noted a 11.7% uh, complication rate. Uh, risk factors were age, uh, tobacco use, and surgery being done by non-foot and ankle specialists. This is something to note, because if we are offering surgery to people, now knowing that there's no difference in functional outcomes or the re-rupture rate with functional rehab, that the extended process becomes a lot more difficult because we are offering surgery that has a complication rate, but with no benefit. This is a comparison between uh, a non-trauma and trauma subspecialty. Uh, the non-trauma was deemed the ones that had a um, uh, foot and ankle uh, interest. And as you can see, there was a significant increase in uh, subspecialty. Uh, treatment and this is what we are avoid, trying to avoid and when this happens it is a it is really a disaster. So when talking about operative treatment versus non-operative a significant reduction in re-ruptures was seen after operative treatment in this 
meta-analysis, which we've done in the BJ, uh, BMJ last year. The problem is they didn't separate out the historical trials. This was done the year before, 10 randomized clinical trials with a total of 9 and 34 randomized patients. Re-rupture rates were equivalent if an early range motion exercise protocol was performed, and a lower incidence of complications of re-rupture, excluding re-rupture was found in non-surgical patients. So the patients who went, underwent functional rehab uh, did better in regards to complications, and there was no difference in functional outcomes for these patients. So there have been some arguments, well, we've moved to a, a minimally invasive surgery, does this make a difference? So there's two papers for this. This first one was a randomized control trial between conservative, uh, minimally invasive and open surgery, and there was no difference at two years across all groups. Uh, this study, again, a randomized control trial um, through the um, conservative percutaneous or open and showed that the muscular strength was actually uh, better weirdly in the orthopedic in this group and um, in the ATRS, ATRS questionnaire at uh, one year uh, there was a trend to an improvement with those treated conservatively compared to uh, percutaneous or open. Um, the risk of DVT uh, when the randomized controlled trials uh, invited everyone back for a Doppler scan at eight weeks and found that there was a 50% uh, DVT group uh, DVT in every Achilles tendon, regardless of what treatment they had. Uh, however, it didn't affect their functional outcomes if it was not symptomatic DVT. Uh, this has been supported by another study. Uh, so uh, expect uh, deep vein thrombosis, be it they may not be clinically diagnosed, diagnosable, but expect them in these uh, patients. Functional rehab immobilization. So there's 14 randomized control trials were identified. Early functional rehab significantly decreased the time to return to work. Uh, early versus late weight bearing. So uh, weight bearing them early didn't uh, change your re-rupture or return to sport or return to work. So you can weight bear them early. Um, this paper was produced this year, for, again, from the uh, Swansea group uh, based on their SMART protocol. Uh, delayed treatment uh, six to uh, 12 weeks. So both the ATRS and ARS improved between the short and long-term follow-up. Uh, there was a 21% decrease in um, power, um, which may be acceptable in the older age groups, for example. Uh, significant difference, uh, no significant difference in ankle uh, plant flexion, dorsiflexion, no significant difference in the length of the injured and uninjured tendons. Um, and only three failed it. So out of the 20 patients they had, only three actually went for surgery afterwards. So even late patients uh, attending to your clinic can still undergo the SMART protocol. So those with the chronic Achilles rupture, so those who have failed uh, management conservatively or surgically, um, that uh, still have functional problems, uh, most studies represent uh, level four data and they all report uh, good results, um, but there's no obvious um, pro group for any of these studies. Four separate classifications of treatment, um, the den heart of treatment algorithm is actually more similar to the uh, my concepts of uh, the treatment for these patients. So this is the den heart of paper. And they have four different grades, uh, two centimeter defect, you can usually get a primary repair, uh, two to five centimeters, you have a V to Y plasty or a gastrocnemius recession. A uh, grade three, five to 10 centimeters is often requiring an FHL transfer or auto allograft. And for the type four, they said you need a bone block allograft. I disagree with this last one. Uh, you can get, um, uh, Allographs uh, of that size, which you can put through the calcaneum without a bone block. If you are treating these, an MRI beforehand to diagnose if there's fatty infiltration within the muscle itself. Uh, if it's fatty infiltration, that muscle is no longer functional. So doing a primary repair or a pay onto the, uh, um, with an allograft to the gastrocnemius or soleus um, may not be functional if you've got fatty infiltration and an FHL transfer would be required uh, regardless. 
Uh, V2Y turndown, uh, as I said, four to eight centimeter defects are usually can be covered with this. Uh, it's actually not part of my practice. I usually do mine with uh, uh, allographs. But the mean octave gap of Achilles tendon in this paper found that afterwards, your AFAS score and your ATRS score actually came up uh, back to what is normal levels. Um, so with this, at long-term follow-up, you can get very good results. Uh, do you teen these to the Achilles? Uh, there's some arguments in regards to different excursions, more power is the Achilles a pain generator. Um, for FGL transfer, the mean octave gap of Achilles in this paper was five centimeters. And they've done this specifically just FGL transfer without actually repairing the tendon as well. Uh, the mean HRS score increased from 39 for optives to 94 at final. But unfortunately, you do lose power. So for an older age group, this is very uh, successful. Uh, but for those you expect to return to a, a sporting activity, for example, uh, this wouldn't be possible. So to just finish off, so the Achilles tendons usually occur on a background of degeneration. There's no advantage of surgery if functional rehabilitation is used. Um, rehabilitation, however, needs to be appropriate. So you need the appropriate treatment um, if you expected the same outcomes as the reported literature. And in chronic tears with functional loss, any gap can be bridged by a number of different techniques. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.